Today's show is sponsored by Adventures Unlimited Press. Take your mind on a literary journey and go to adventuresunlimitedpress.com to purchase books from our famed experts right here on Truth Be Told. That's adventuresunlimitedpress.com. What's your thoughts on government cover-ups or covert societies attempting to control humanity? Do you believe in ancient astronauts, intergalactic communication, or extraterrestrial visitations? Ever had an experience with disembodied spirits or the paranormal universe? Are these subjects fact or fiction? Each week, Tony and Eddie explore these unbelievable realities and beyond. Exclusively on Truth Be Told. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm your host, Tony Sweet. And I'm Eddie Connor. Today our topic is about an extraordinary journey to the other side. And we have author Annie Kagan bringing her very popular book, The Afterlife of Billy Fingers, How My Bad Boy Brother Proved to Me There Is Life After Death. It's such a good book, too. And everybody, this is a fascinating true story of Annie's ongoing after-death communication with her brother Billy. Now, when her brother Billy died unexpectedly and began speaking to her from the other side, Annie agreed to accompany him on his journey through the mysteries of death. As Billy reaches from the other side to change his sister's life and the lives of those around her, he shares secrets about the bliss and the wonder that lots of us humans will be experiencing in the afterlifes ourselves. So the truth is, Tony, we all lose loved ones, but is it really true that they can speak to us from the other side, or do you think it's just wishful thinking? To find out more, please welcome author and musician Annie Kagan to Truth Be Told. Yay! Hi, everybody. I'm Eddie Connor. And I'm Tony Sweet. And with us, we have Annie Kagan on the line. Hi, Annie. Hi, guys. Hi, Tony. Hi, Eddie. Hi. Well, first of all, we've been um, threatening to have you on the show for, for how many months now? Time. So I'm like, I read your book. It has to be probably nine months ago or something like that. And I'm like, we've got to get Annie. We've got to get Annie. And then you'd started posting all the beautiful banners on Facebook. And then I'm sharing them with everybody. And by the way, we need to talk about that, Tony and Annie. You know why? 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 Because there were uh, a lot of people that were like, yes, I've heard my loved ones from spirit speak to me. And yes, I feel like they can hear me. I can feel their presences around me. And then there were a few people, Annie, and we would like yeah. to, to ask um, uh, if this happens with you frequently in your line of work. And as someone who was talking to Billy from the other side, there would be a couple of people that are like, I don't know. That sounds like a little hooey to me because <laughs> if people could really do that, wouldn't we have heard about it by now? And wouldn't it already be in mainstream media? And my my answer to that was it has been around since the beginning of time, and it has been around in literature since the beginning of time, and people have been doing it in all walks of life since the beginning of time. But for me, I'm finding that in the last 10 years, 15 years, it's starting to really escalate into mainstream. That's my answer to that question about why we haven't heard about things like communicating with people in spirit. What would your answer be to that for some of the yeah, skeptics? Yeah, that's, that's a great. I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, first of all, Joseph Campbell, the great Joseph Campbell, says that in all cultures, Across time, if you study cultures all over, over the world, there's always been belief in an afterlife. And in the Eastern cultures, there's always been a belief that you can talk to your ancestors and that you can communicate with those on the other side. Western culture does not share those beliefs. Also, um, before there were near-death experiences like the ancient Greeks, they always spoke to the other side. Yeah. They would go on retreats in psychomantums and, and go through these journeys where they communicated with the other side. 
the problem came actually when religion kind of stepped in Mm -hmm. and made it a, a sin to communicate with the other side because I, when, when, when my brother started to communicate with me, I started to wonder like why it was so taboo because I certainly didn't want anyone to know. Like I say in the book, you know, I kept it hidden for a really long time and I didn't want to be known as kooky. (laughs) And, um, I found out that, Way back in the days of George Anderson, George Anderson was a really famous psychic. Ooh, and I'd love he, me some George Anderson. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they actually put him in an asylum oh. for when he was younger for talking to spirits. And so it was a very threatening thing to religion, and they made it like a like a a sin, like you should not talk to the dead because the truth is, in my opinion, when you do have an experience of the other side, it's a very enlightening experience Mm. and you don't feel like you need a middleman to go through. You don't feel like, you know, you need rules or you need someone who's supposedly higher than you to connect you to the divine forces, you, you're you able to do it yourself. So that's my wow. take on it. I, I wow. have done lots of past life. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this work even before I knew what this work was. And it's not, uh-huh. because, it's not because I'm a, a third generation psychic, because believe me, I grew up Southern Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. It was not pretty to be psychic and gay <laughs> and, <laughs> and poor in the South in the 60s. Um, but it, it's not because of that. I always had an affinity for it and in in an inner knowing about it. And I'd watch my grandma have experiences, then my mother have experiences, and then I would have experiences. But the thing was, we never ever spoke about it because of quote religion and, and exactly and it's this it is i think you've hit the nail on the head with this it's like if you don't need the person in the pulpit to to help you feel god energy christ energy our loved ones in spirit that sort of thing then you have your direct line in your unique way to mm-hmm. the universe to god to heaven right. if you will and 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 I love, I love your book because, in the beginning, uh, it's not that you were a, a diehard skeptic, you, but you you I love all of the, and we'll let you tell the audience because it's your book, The Afterlife of Billy Fingers, and it's how my bad boy brother proved to me there's life after death. Um, I loved how you were skeptic and you didn't just quote, say, oh, that's my brother. Well, let me go down this happy little trail of rainbows and unicorns and just trust everything I'm getting. I love how you scientifically, spiritually, uh, mentally, intuitively, creatively went on your journey. And then I also love how Billy was delivering the physical stuff that would blow your friends and associates minds. Yes, it was. Um, thank you. And and I wrote the book in a way, because the book is conversations that I had with Billy. And I really wanted the reader to experience what I did, which was the unfolding of an amazing mystery. Because my brother, who was my bad boy brother, and I think that's another important aspect of the book was, you know, my brother was a very, what we would call flawed person. I mean, he was, he was a heroin addict. He had a lot of trouble being successful in life. He also had his wonderful high moments of, you know, uh, running drug centers for kids and he was very charismatic and he was a wonderful being who had, addiction problems and other problems. And the fact that he gets hit by a car and then comes back and talks to me with this amazing wisdom and very clearly just gives so many people hope that, you know, unlike 
religion, you know, we're, we're kind of on a religion kick here, not all religion, but you know, what I, what I've learned from Billy is that what we call God, and I don't like to use that word because I find it's kind of limiting mm -hmm. the way we think of it. Mm -hmm. So I like to say, you know, the divine is like, so much more amazing and loving and forgiving and just completely compassionate that when you go to the other side, all that's left is your beauty. You don't take the other stuff with you because it can't really survive in that atmosphere. So um, the fact that he showed up and I heard his voice really clearly and his personality was intact and he was joking around with me. But then when he stopped talking to me, I really believe that I had imagined it to make myself feel better, that somehow my imagination was working over time so that I would believe that he still existed and, and, and I wouldn't have to go through so much pain. But the truth is that the encounters with him were very healing. And I think on the second or third time he appeared, he said, look, I know you think you're crazy, so I'm going to prove to you that, uh, that I'm not just your imagination. And he went about methodically giving me proofs, telling me things that I couldn't know about people, events that were going to happen. And the strange thing was that even after months of this, I still, I still didn't really believe it. And um, after a while, though, I knew for sure that my experience was real and that it was my destiny and fate to write a book and to let other people know that um, we really are eternal and you really will see your loved ones. It's not just some fairy tale that's been made up to make you feel better right. when someone dies. There really is a world beyond this one. Well, Annie, I want to ask you this. Uh, I know you are, were uh, a skeptic or healthy skeptic, whatever you want to call it, but let's go to, to your brother. Was uh, even though he was flawed and you know had his issues and problems, was he a skeptic? Did you ever have a conversation about if he was a skeptic about afterlife? Or That's a great question. Um, it wasn't that I was a skeptic about afterlife mm -hmm. because I would say that I believed that something did exist. I had okay. no idea what it was, right. and I didn't really think about it very much. Billy also believed that there was something, but what I found out later, because one of the things that he did, which is was one of the amazing proofs that he gave me, was he led me on a treasure hunt, and I found hmm. the journals that he wrote at the end of his oh, life wow. when he was really suffering, and it was just filled with like a love for God and 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 the amazing thing was it, he said like he wanted to write a book to help humanity this is when he was alive That's and please crazy. God help me do that and then he did it after sure, he yeah. died yeah. I mean so many so many miracles but I would say Billy was always very spiritual very full of love loving nature, loving life. So, but I don't think, um, I would say that an interesting thing was that our father was a hypochondriac. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> our father, and our, our father always thought he was going to die. And <laughs> so we talked about death a lot in my house. Like most people, they never talk about death. My father was always talking about death. You're going to die. It's going to be okay. I'm going to build you a house with a swimming pool. Don't worry. Cause, you know, <laughs> he was afraid he was going to die when I was very young. And then he would tell me that he spoke to his father and mother who died pretty young. That's why he always thought he was going to die young. And 
that he would have these long conversations with them. And actually when he was dying, he was having right in front of us, he was having conversations with his mother and father and his brothers. And I actually believed it was all in his mind, you know, Mm. that he was like taking both parts. Mm. But now I think it was real and that it kind of runs in our family. Yes. It, go ahead. No, I, what's funny, yeah. when, I, when I was a young kid, this is probably in, the, I think, late 70s, early 80s, my grandfather, he, he passed away in, in 1981. But before he passed away, he actually told me about a time, and my mom and dad told me when he actually about died in, in the late 60s, before I was even born. But he told me directly that when when he was in the hospital that he died, like that he he flatlined on on the table, and he went through the tunnel, saw the light, went to an open field, saw his mother. His mother told him it wasn't time for him to leave this world. He had things to do. Go back. He went back. Um, have you had any dreams? I mean, I know you have dreams of your brother, but have you had dreams of your own about the afterlife mm. or the spirit world? Well, actually, just just the other week, I had a dream of my father, hmm. and um, because my father doesn't, my father died quite a while ago. I don't really feel contact with him much I do with my mom but this time my father came in the dream and it was really interesting because it was like I heard a rumor that my father wasn't really dead (laughs) 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 and and that I could go visit him and somehow I found where he was and I was so happy to see him and he always had loved me so much and his his eyes were just beaming with love and he said to me in life just take the good and leave the bad wow and it was really meaningful to me at that moment because i was having like a hard day or something Mm -hmm. or whatever and i knew when i woke up i had really seen him and i i encourage people i mean it's interesting because also when i was in college I had done an experiment with dreams and what I learned was that if people kept uh, um, some paper or a journal by their bed and then before they went to sleep they would ask for a specific dream, they would start to have them. So Hmm. I suggest that everyone keeps the paper and pencil by your bed and ask for a visit. And just keep asking. I don't care if it takes a year, you know. Just keep doing it. Keep having that intention because it's real. I mean, it kind of blows my mind that I'm on the phone with you, like, saying these things because it wasn't (laughs) at all the plan that I had for my life. And going back to what you said before, Eddie, about the last 10 years, everything is heating up. I think it's because maybe the baby boomers who have done so much to change society, they're now open and they're, they're, they're aging and they're, they're open to changing the way we see death. Yeah, I think so too. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. What were you going to say? I was going to say because I, um, know that there is that there is death as a doorway when my mom died which was after billy it was so much easier to let her go and to you know even help her along and it just changes the whole experience and that's that's what i really hope people are are able to do is is change death into something more beautiful i how did the mother? I mean, I'm just saying. You said your mother passed away after Billy. After. Could yes. You, can you tell tell the audience a little bit? Uh, did he visit her? And if and if he did or did not, what? How did how did she take take it when you told her that Billy was contacting you? 
Well, it's funny because my mother, my family was always very open. My mother, father, Billy, and me, and my mother really wasn't afraid of death. But losing Billy, I would say she pretty much had a nervous breakdown. You know, the way he died, being hit by a car, and the drug addiction. She she was really, really bad when he died. And even though she had been open when I told her I was communicating with him, she would say, oh, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> like, she, she didn't believe it. It, yeah. didn't, it didn't really mean anything to her. Mm. And um, that was kind of sad for me. Mm. And then one day after Billy, and, and I never read her anything that Billy gave me. I just, she didn't want to hear it. Mm. One day after he had dictated this part of the book about the pearl and the oyster, I I put it in my bag and I went to visit her. And um, I took her for a walk and the sun was really shining. And I said to her, mom, you know, because I was always trying to draw her out, like, tell me a story. And she said, well, you know, it's funny. I knew you were going to ask me that. And I knew what I was going to say. And I just read a book about a mother and a daughter. And the daughter goes away. And I don't remember the whole story. But the, but the, the ending of the story was take the difficult things in life and make them into beautiful pearls. <laughs> and that's exactly what Billy had just dictated to me. I said, Ma, I had something at the house. I have to show you. <laughs> and I read it to her and she couldn't believe it. She said, oh my God, now I have to believe you. This, <laughs> this can't be a coincidence. And then that night or that morning, it was that morning, Billy, she, she felt biz, Billy visiting her and he was wearing a tuxedo. Oh. And I had the same experience that morning. So uh, she came to understand that he really still existed and she got to express all her love to him. That's another important thing is that, you know, we could transform our relationships after somebody crosses over also. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. But it, yeah, you know, a lot uh -huh. of a lot of people like I I like how you describe Billy, and then we get to know him obviously in your book, um, and how society would maybe describe him as flawed. And isn't it funny how on the Earth plane, first of all, it's so flipping judgmental, but uh, isn't it funny how on the Earth plane, if there was somebody like Billy who was having an addiction issue and or uh, even if he wasn't a nice guy, Billy was a nice guy, but let's say he was really not a nice guy. Let's say he was like Scrooge or something. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Isn't it funny how on the earth plane, we just naturally assume all those people that did one tiny microscopic atomic molecular little boo-boo, <laughs> they're going to go to hell and all of the other people go go to heaven. And then I love that the bad boy brother is in the light, that he it's from his perspective. And I love how you it what he through you communicated about the contrast and what the addiction brought to him and the way that it affects the earth plane. It it, it was remarkable. And that's why Dr. Raymond Moody said this is a fascinating book, people. You need to read it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's very interesting that I, I have a friend who's a religious scholar and a astrophysicist. And the, when he first read the book, he said, you, you can't, you can't tell this to people. I know. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you can't tell people that they won't be punished mm. because there'll be chaos on earth. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> and I said, well, that's like assuming that people are only kind because they're afraid of punishment. Yeah. And guess what? You know, we really do have souls and 
we're not just kind and good and loving mm. because we're afraid of punishment. I mean, that's, that's crazy. And also the other thing that I realize is that I don't really understand the way it all works. I don't understand what the divine actually is, what the relationship to everyone is, you know, the unconditional love. Mm. I, I understand it's all so much greater than me and that I don't have to figure it all out and I can just have the most beautiful life that I can on this very, very difficult, crazy world that we live in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, that's it. I don't have to judge. That doesn't mean I have to like everybody or what they do. Right. <laughs> you know, but, it, but, but uh, and I certainly don't, but it's, I mean, if you break the law and you hurt somebody, yes, of course. But what goes on after we die is really not, not me who's in charge of it. I think what they did, they shouldn't tell them they're going to hell. They're saying you're going to have to come back. <laughs> that would that would make me okay. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, isn't that that that's very interesting, right? Yeah, because that's that's another kind of secret, which I think um, is one of the reasons people appreciate Billy. Yes. People who haven't read the book, you know, he he's kind of a talking in kind of a street cred way. Yeah, it's not lofty, although it's it's also quite beautiful. Yes. But he. He admits um, how difficult and how brave we are to have the human journey. I think one place he says, you know, how noble is the human journey from divine to dust and back again. Mm, it's, it's, it's quite something. Well, and not this will sound like I'm bringing it down a note, but I really am not. I, I just think I, I have to tell you, I love the contrast of the book. I like how you went on the journey emotionally that you went on. I like how there was a part of you as you were receiving proof. We all want proof. When we lose somebody to non-physical and they cross over to the other side, there's great truth when we receive proof. And I think the proof mm -hmm. in the truth or the truth in the proof is <laughs> a bridging technique to other members of society who are on the fence about it or who secretly believe it but will never say it publicly because that's a very brave thing. But I want to go back. Whenever you say he was hit by a car, if my memory serves me right, I think he had just what, gotten out of the hospital or something and literally was he wasn't in a car when he was hit. He was going across the street and was hit by a car. Yes, he he actually went to the hospital because, uh, from what I understood later, he was coughing up blood, yeah. mm. and you know he he was not doing well at the time, and they wouldn't admit him to the hospital. They would only admit him to the admit him to the detox, yeah. and he absolutely didn't want that, and he got really angry. And so one of the nurses called the police and he ran out of the hospital onto the highway and got hit by a car. Oh, no. And wow. it, 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 yes. it's, it's remarkably graphic. Um, and in the image that we get with his, I think, face through the windshield that right there where the driver was. Yes. And the contrast of that kind of scary kind of some of our worst fears for people we love moment and then the light the love the information the grace the frequency the ability for him from spirit to say i was out of my body before that happened i was already a non-physical mm -hmm. don't look at that part of me and then give you clues about where the keys are and who to contact and where to find the business card <laughs> and all oh of yeah i mean there's no way that I can doubt this experience. Yeah. There was one part that was the crescendo for me. And that was when he was describing where he was in the afterlife. He was describing voices singing to him, beautiful voices singing. And he told me the words he was singing. 
And then he said, just like Mahler's eighth. Mm -hmm. And when he would do stuff like that, you know, when I knew he was giving me a proof, Mm -hmm. it was like being hit by lightning. Mm. Like it was almost as if my whole nervous system was, was erased. Like everything I believed about life and death was just erased. And when I put on the YouTube, I, I searched for Mahler's Ace, and the finale was called Chorus Mysticus, <laughs> Mystical <laughs> Chorus. And it was exactly as he had described, exactly the same voices, the same words. There's no way in the world that could have been a coincidence. There's just I didn't even know that that piece of music existed. So from that moment on, I knew that it had to be true. And like it or not, I had to tell people about it. Wow. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take about a 15 second break and we're going to be right back. And I want to ask you about your music career and then how you ended up becoming an author of this book, even though you were in a writing group working on another book. (laughs) You got it. All right. We'll be right back. This is Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Tony Sweet. I'm Eddie Connor. And we'll be right back. We hope you're enjoying today's show, which is sponsored by Earth Friendly Products. For over 40 years, Earth Friendly Products have brought you the greenest home merchandise for all your family needs. Learn more at ecos.com. That's E-C-O-S dot com. Now back to the show. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I am Eddie Connor. I'm Tony Sweet. And our guest today is the fabulous, internationally famed author and musician, Annie Kagan. She's written the book that is a remarkable bestseller. I personally read it. Tony's going to read it now because I know how he is. It's uh, called The Afterlife of Billy Fingers, and it's how my bad boy brother proved to me that there is life after death. Thank you for joining us again, Annie. Now, I want to ask you this. Now, whenever I read the book, I was, because I'm a writer too, I love to write and I love writing groups. I love the energy that comes from that sort of sense of community of like-minded people. And near in the community where you live, you were going to a writing group. You were actually working on a totally different book than The Afterlife of Billy Fingers when this whole experience happened for you. But before that, you were excuse the the verbiage uh, weren't you like a mucky muck 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 in the music industry right like big big person there right no yes you <laughs> were. I, I I was re- wrong but 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 no actually what happened was when i was really young like 15 mm-hmm. years old i was writing songs and i had a manager and and I was supposed to record, but I, I never, I never really wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. I always felt very private about it. Even though I was writing music, it felt private. Like I loved to be in the studio creating it, but I didn't really want to be out there. Then I did that for a long time. And then actually I went back to school and became a chiropractor Mm -hmm. and that's where the, um, I would say the path of my life took me over because after being a doctor for a while, I started to become depressed Mm. because all day you're hearing about illness, Mm. right? And I'm very creative. So I would, I would feel, yeah, very empathic and I would start not feeling well. And so I decided I was going to learn to meditate so that I would be stronger, but actually it made me more and more sensitive. (laughs) And then I couldn't stand being in New York City. And I was again working on music and doing lyrics and I was so tired of the music business and, you know, always being like, oh, we're almost there, we're almost there. And so I just kept getting more and more sensitive and I just, left everything behind and sold what I had and bought a small little house. And I decided to join a writing class 
just because kind of I didn't know anybody and I was all alone and I just joined a class because I was a lyricist, right? Mm -hmm. And so I always had a love affair with words. And I was writing a book and I never expected the book to go anywhere. I was just doing it for fun. And in a way, I think that that was also my fate Mm -hmm. because I learned a little bit about what makes a good book and what doesn't make a good book. And and so that class was really important. And then Billy died and showed up and I worked very, very long and hard on that little book. I bet you did. I bet you did. I, uh, so when you were having uh, the, the messages from Billy, I mean, there's probably, it sounds like there's been a lot, but have, how many have been, it took you a while to understand, or was he so clear about his messages, or, or, or did you have trouble with some of the messages that uh, you couldn't quite figure out? No, it was always, it was always very clear, mm-hmm. and I, ha- I had the, how do you say, the task mm. of, See, Billy, Billy's part of the book. Cause the book is Billy and me and Billy and me speaking. And his stuff came out so clear and so easy and so beautifully that I knew it wasn't me because I struggle with my writing. Like it could take me, you know, as writers know, it could take me, you know, three hours to write the correct paragraph the way I want it. Yes. <laughs> So that's how I always knew it had to be real because I don't write like that. And also, Billy's very funny. He's much funnier than I am. And in the book, you know, it's it's coming from the afterlife, but he's very amusing. So um, I think that so many people I hear from feel very relieved because Billy always loved people and he's had when he was on earth, he had the highest and the lowest experiences. He wasn't always an addict. You know, he had a good life and a good marriage and, and he had money. He, he, he was like a cat. He had like nine different lives <laughs> and people from all walks of life can relate to what he's saying. And they always say to me, he sounds like what I feel like inside. He, he puts words to, the spiritual things and the things about living here that we all feel. And I think that that's, that's why the book is so popular with so many different people. Mm. You know, something it's interesting and it's, it's going to sound like a non uh, associate associated segue. Caitlin Jenner, formerly Bruce yes. Jenner. Um, yes. I, I, I think he chose to transition into she at a remarkable time in history. But I also think the majority of the reason why there's been way less uh, negative feedback with Caitlin is because Caitlin lived inside of Bruce for 65 years. And inside of Bruce was always this other uh, alternate personality, a dominant personality that get, kept getting pushed down, that Bruce purely had uh, a love for, a connection to, an affinity mm-hmm. for. And so at 65 years later, when Caitlin got to become Caitlin physically, and then Bruce started to sort of you know, stand behind the curtain and let Caitlin be in the spotlight, I think the world responds to sincerity. I think humanity responds to authenticity. And I, I think his energy, purely forwarded through time, space, reality, met Caitlin this past year as Caitlin came out to the world. And that's why I think it's little to no negative kickback. And the reason, mm. the reason I'm bringing this up is I feel, I don't know why, but I feel like your love affair with words, your love affair with music, lyrics, meditation, 
being an empath yourself, being intuitive. I, it's very fascinating how you were, I think, on the Upper East Side in Manhattan or something, right? Yeah. And, I mean, that's what a lot of people, and your practice was thriving, and your your music and your writing was going wonderful, and then you basically let all of that go and went to your wonderful, charming sanctuary somewhere mm-hmm. close to water, I think. Yeah. And then this happens with Billy, and I wonder if you would have been able to receive him as purely and gracefully as you have if you were still the chiropractor on the Upper East Side. No, it would have been impossible. I, I really feel that, don't you? No, it would have been impossible. That's that's why I feel like everything mm. in my life pushed me. Yeah. Like some people, one of the negative comments that people say sometimes, which doesn't really bother me because I don't expect anyone to believe me. And truthfully, I don't actually care. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I don't. I love that. Which I think is very important. Like, I really don't care. That's, you know, it's just my job to tell the story and you could take it or leave it. But um, sometimes people have said to me, oh, well, you know, she was writing a book anyway. So she was just writing a book and then she decided to write this book. Mm-hmm. Look, she was in a writing class. That that proves that, you know, she's false. Mm-hmm. And it's really the other way around yes. where I feel like I was in almost involuntarily pushed yes. to leave my practice, which was thriving, yeah. you know, to, to go live by myself with my cats and join this little teeny group so that I would have some knowledge of how to write a book when this happened. Yes. Right. Yes. And so it was, it was my life. So many things in my life was preparing me. Like somebody once told me that, being a musician prepared me because music is invisible. You're working with invisible energy yes. and invisible sound and meditation prepared me. And, you know, I, I never could have done it in, in New York. I had to be really alone in a quiet place. And so everything, everything led me to this. And I think the world now is having more and in- people in the world, I should be more specific, and more specific than that, people in North America are Mm -hmm. regularly having more and more experiences like this because you're brave enough to put the material out to the world, and they read it, and even if they're closeted about their uh, experiences with loved ones in spirit, or they're out there on platforms like you are sharing the information with people, the fact that it's out there it's getting lighter, like the energy is starting to catch up. Well, there's a handful of you, really, honestly, if you want to be blunt about it. There's a small handful of you, Annie, Dr. Raymond yeah. Moody. There's a handful of other people. But you are the small pod of leading edgers, putting the information out there in a brave way and I, I know you don't see yourself as a brave person putting it out there you're like i am a warrior screw everybody i talk to dead people <laughs> i know that's not what you're doing what you're doing is simply sharing an experience that's sincere and authentic with the world and it is absolutely like a web of light coming from you and billy connecting other people that normally would never have spoken about this therefore i feel like caitlin this is being received in a more welcoming way than it could have been five years ago, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago in North America. Hmm. Mm. And yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's time has come. Yes. And if we, if we could take the edge off of grief, just a tiny bit, because it's, you know, even though I know about Billy when I lost my mom, mm. I miss her. Yeah. You know, even though yeah. she's around me, I mean, it was very, very hard to let her go. But knowing that she still exists for real and that I will meet her again 
and she's around me and I could feel her love, it takes the edge off of that finality. And I think also when we approach death ourselves, Mm -hmm. knowing that it's a doorway to something extraordinary will change the, the, the fear for people. Um, a friend of mine was reading my book. She was in hospice and she mm. was, oh my God. or she was in the hospital and the woman next to her was very, very sick and dying. And she saw the book and she picked up the book and she, she read it and she said, Oh my God, I'm not afraid to die anymore. That that's what I'm talking about right there. Yeah. Like, Oh my God, how unbelievable, you know, that I could be a, be a part of that is uh is an honor it's 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 an honor i love that i lost my mom in january and in some and i because i can talk to dead people i'm a little petite flower princess giver goddess medium but i'm a big old wanking psychic and uh-huh. um and so mediumship is not my strength or i'm not as comfortable with it as i should be because i can feel tony going bitch please i'm always like oh yeah yeah and um <laughs> so but when when mom was in the process of transitioning, she wanted to go to the hospice hospital because they believed what mom and I believed, that there is an afterlife, and they uh, want you to transition in dignity. They don't want to keep you alive again for some other thing, even though you're ready to cut loose. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And each of the hospice workers, she didn't get to go to the hospice hospital, uh, so she literally, we she was at home. And so I got to be with her during that entire, um, the last is like the last month and a half of her life. And as each of the hospice people came in and there were lots of them in all walks of life, as each of them walked in, they came in as if they had the afterlife of Billy fingers in their heart and mm. their mind. Wow. Now, some of them spoke about it and some of them said nothing about it, but you can feel, Feel the difference in the elevated consciousness of these workers and how they interacted with my mom. So she could die in dignity and help me help her do that. And I feel you are elevating the consciousness of the planet and the solar system and the universe. And I know that sounds grandiose, but honestly, energy is energy. It's got to go somewhere. And your energy of elevated consciousness and love and light and information Mm -hmm. is going out and changing the universe. Thank you. But I, it's, it's not really my energy. That's that's the truth, and I'm not saying that to be modest, <laughs> but it's it's really way beyond me. Mm. Uh, it, it's really not not me because I could be cranky and <laughs> oh, whatever, please. and I'm just a very 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 <laughs> normal person <laughs> with all kinds of stuff, and that's that's one of the reasons I don't go out and I don't do speaking engagements. I, I do interviews and I keep my life very private because I don't want people to make me into yes. something I'm not or for me to have to act as if I'm something I'm not. Yes. Because the truth is I'm totally ordinary with you know, but the this energy thing yeah. is something else. Oh. It it's something else. Well, Annie, and oh, and if I could have resisted doing it, I would have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but 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 the truth is, I I just I just couldn't. That's it was, right. You know, I couldn't. So, it's it's something much, much beyond me. Well, we thank you for being a catalyst and a channel for that information, and thank you for doing interviews like yes, ours. Yes, and we are so honored to have you on the show, and we definitely oh, would love to have you back. Oh, it's a pleasure to talk to both of you. Yes. I knew this would be very, very enjoyable for oh, me. Oh, well, thank you. Now, are you going to be working on any other books that we might be looking forward to? Uh, as of now, no, <laughs> because the truth is that was such an enormous yeah, effort. I'm sure, yeah. And that was like the ultimate book that I, I like. I don't, I, I don't know where else 
I can actually go. I mean, it might happen sometime, but not now. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. And so go to uh, afterlifeofbillyfingers.com. Check out her website. And uh, please go buy the book if you haven't. Like I said, I've started and I'm going to finish this book because... Now that I uh, have heard your voice and your spirit, it's yeah. we've. Uh, I can see why people have fallen in love with the book and yourself. So, yeah, and why when we yeah. read it, we buy like five copies and give to other people, and then they read it, and then they buy five copies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Thank we you, adore Annie. you. Good night. All right. Good night. Bye. 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 All right. Well, uh, that was great. I know. Eddie. I love her. And you know what? It was so worth the wait, right? Yeah, we've been about four or five months that we've been waiting to have her on. Um, and she, you know, she said she wanted to wait until November, and she lived up to her word, which yes. I respect. Yeah. And uh, now that uh, we got to hear her voice and hear her story and just that, that spirit, that's a spirit. Yeah, right the real deal. Mm-hmm. All right, so, well, if you tuned in late or if you uh, would love to hear this recording again, uh, you can see the video on our YouTube channel, Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. Uh, Please go there. It should be up in the next few days. Uh, All of our podcasts, the audio podcast, is on TuneIn, on Stitcher, on Spreaker, on uh, where else? Uh, iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio and on UBN Radio, our page there. And so go to truthbetoldwebtv.com. Uh, All of our archives are there also. So uh, we thank you so much. Now, you guys want to stick around if you're live. And uh, we're going to have Brandy Vale, uh, a personal and professional development coach. Uh, You know, sometimes we need that little help. Sometimes we need a lot of help. Well, today we need a little push. Sometimes we need a big push. Quit pushing me, Eddie. Push me. (laughs) Push it. All right. We're out of here. So stick around uh, for the next episode of Truth Be Told. Be right back.